Well, good evening. Uh, welcome to our seventh lecture in our series of historical theology. Again, we're going through the doctrine of God and the doctrine of the Trinity, and we are looking through the early church, starting with the New Testament church, uh, first century, and moving our way up uh, just throughout, obviously, the the course of history. And uh, today we're going to be looking at an early church father named Novation. Um, not innovation, but novation. Let's get to his little slide for him real quick. Yeah, novation. That's how you spell it, novation. So he is <clears throat> he's an obscure father, and the fact that he's not really well known, um, he was born or lived around 210 to 280 um, AD, was an educated priest, a theologian, a writer. Um, and so there's com some controversy with him, which we'll talk about at the end, but he was the first kind of, about, yeah, first church father to write a really robust treatise on the Trinity for the Western church. Um, he, he advanced his, his theology kind of beyond Tertullian, who we talked about was a, a pivotal figure. Um, and, but notably in, in discussion of the eternal sonship of Christ. And so, um, obviously, we're going to be focusing on kind of, kind of his understandings of the Trinity. Uh, we'll be talking through a little bit of anthropomorphic language, divine simplicity, and again, a lot of these things that uh, the, the fathers had to deal with um, as they're dealing with um, you know, false teachings and, and obviously a lot of challenges to uh, the kind of language, the kind of, you know, trying to really comprehend uh, the doctrine of the Trinity and having the language to, to really uh, explain the concepts behind the oneness and the threeness of God. So we will uh, get going and, and hear a little bit of, of novation. Again, I think he's a really he's obscure, but I think he has some really, really uh, important things to say. And he definitely, uh, again, he was another you know figure in the development of the Doctrine of the Trinity. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. So, so novation... <laughs> In his work, he gives a clear explanation of biblical anthropomorphisms in terms of God's accommodation to human language. That's an important thing is the language being used in the Bible and how we are to interpret it. And the, the one extreme is to take things super literal. So when God says he has uh, human qualities, to take them as human qualities. But as we've talked about throughout these lectures and, and he addresses here, that that's anthropomorphic language that God is using to accommodate himself to the human language. And he uses, you see in this slide here, he uses the doctrine of Trinitarian circumcession and anticipates what later theology came to call the hypostatic union of the two natures of Christ in one person and the communication of idioms between the natures, end quote. Um, so what is he saying about that? So that a term, circumcession, uh, it's the first time we've probably used it in a lecture, but it, it refers to the three persons dwelling within each other. There's also another term which is called perichoresis. It uh, has to do with the activity of the divine persons. Again, they're not distinct beings, right? They're, they don't occupy space, but they indwell in one another as Father, Son, and Spirit of the divine being of God. And so um, he kind of starts to... Um, as it says here, it anticipates what later theology came to call the hypostatic union. So he's talking about the standpoint where he's starting with the Trinitarian language, and then we start moving into discussion of the two natures of Christ in the one person. And there's a phrase called communication of idioms, or communicatio idiomata, which is the Latin term, which if you do reading this stuff, you might have seen that. So it has to do with the communication of properties between the divine and the human nature of Christ. So his circumcision understanding kind of, again, starts to become uh, helpful language to discuss that those concepts. And we're not going to get into it a whole lot here. I don't think, actually, if I recall, we even do that. I focus more on the Trinitarian, Trinitarian piece of, of, of novation. So. So, so as noted already, Novation's work on the Trinity was a, a further advancement than others before him, especially Tertullian. Uh, not much is stated as to why he wrote this treatise. However, it seems that his aim was to articulate the Trinity in accordance with the rule of faith. Again, there's the, the Apostles' Creed, um, and the rule of faith has to do with what's already been understood of what the Scriptures teach. So he's trying to remain within that um, that in, you know, interpretive guideline, if you will, right? The rule of faith. 
Um, Beginning back to the anthropomorphic piece. So in his writings, in a small section, he addresses anthropomorphic language. And I say that because uh, it's important because one's theology goes amok when a theologian loses his footing, letting the figurative or the idiomatic language guide his interpretive choices about God. We see that especially like in open theism and relational theism. Um, I know at times it's, it's challenging because we're so used to reading the Bible um, and the language used, even as just those that are, I would say, that recognize that difference can, can kind of slip into um, getting kind of sloppy in our terms, if you will, um, about that. So, but so he talks about that. So ultimately... What Novation says is that Scripture is an accommodation of God to man. And we've been talking about this, right? Where, where God communicates to mankind in a language based upon what man sees in creation. We're going back to Romans 1, 19 through 20. That becomes like the key, right? The key of understanding how the relationship of, of God's language and understanding God is to us, is that he mediates it to us through, through created things. Uh, but to be consistent in how we speak about God regarding his essence and his acts, we must not take figurative language about God, particularly about God having hands, arms, uh, ears, eyes, face. We can't take those things literally. And so he talks about that in his work. Because <clears throat> if we did that, I mentioned before, it'd be, we would end up expressing something about God that contradicts what the Bible teaches about the nature and essence of God, who is behind, beyond all comprehension. So in his work on the Trinity, which is what we're going through, again, we're, it's 31 chapters, but we're going to go through just some kind of key portions. Um, um, I'm going to be focusing on chapters 2 through 9, where he devotes his attention to the essence and attributes of God as triune. And again, the, the direction or the scope of these lectures is to look at the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Trinity, uh, throughout um, the Christian tradition. Now, in a formal doctor or historical theology class you would you would definitely get you know more you get broader into other topics uh, more involvement with certain things but again I really want to keep this focused here because it's kind of a it's it's an area that's that's under a lot of a lot of fire right now if you will that I see in the literature out there uh, you know, even just you know, various books coming out where there's a lot of discussion that um, there's a classical view of God that's been um, kind of uh, overlooked for many many years modern theology has definitely gone more towards the the personalism the relationalism kind of perspective and has really again gone astray from the classical doctrines of christian theism so again the point of these lectures is to really bring these out and, and show that that uh, the church has always thought these things and, and what happened is that there was a a moved pragmatism that kind of said that we don't need to focus on these classical doctrines of god and i think that was definitely too uh, uh, made our theology sloppy and made more made, made God more manlike than Him being uh, the creature and us being the, the cre- uh, <laughs> sorry Him being the creator and us being the creatures. See, that's what happens, right? We just kind of blow it sometimes. So, um, so in chapter two, Novation begins with God as above all things, containing all things, immense, eternal, transcending the mind of man is inexplicable in all discourse and loftier than all sublimity. So we've already used these terms, you know, immensity, eternal, transcending, above all things, containing all things. Not that um, he contains all of creation himself, but when he says containing, there is no end to God. There is no, uh, nothing that where God isn't. So it's not like he, anything is, that he contains all things as, as being like objects are God, but that he is everywhere. So it's kind of a different way of saying it. So, <clears throat> theology, theology should start with God, always. Uh, very first lecture that I did, that's where we started at, right? It's about God and himself, God and his relation to creation, um, and that's where we start at. And so, Novation, he begins there as well. He discusses God's unboundedness in time and space. And he says, For we read that he contains all things, and therefore that there could have been nothing beyond himself because since he has not since he has not any beginning so consequently he is not conscious of an ending unless perchance and far from us be the thought he at some time began to be and is not above all things 
but as he began to be after something else, he would be beneath that which was before himself, and would so be found to be of less power, and that he is designated as subsequent even in time itself. For this reason, therefore, he is always unbounded, because nothing is greater than he, he always eternal, because nothing is more ancient than he. So we see these classical descriptions, and you know, and there are those that would read these statements, the critics at least, and say, you know, we're just these are just philosophical terms and and lofty ways to talk about God, but the thing is that that God is incomprehensible. We don't know what the divine spirit is. Uh, we cannot we cannot reconcile uh, God's eternality. So, and if we have God figured out, then we don't have a God that is what the Bible depicts. And so, it's important that we um, you know we we discuss these terms. We we present you know the, the 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 essence of who God is, and then we learn about Him through revelation. And so, and the only reason He could be as glorious as Scripture is, as Scripture reveals Him. This is kind of the foundation of, of who God is in his essence. Now, again, we don't know what his essence is, so a lot of times we're, we're just, again, we're using negative theology to explicate the greatness of the divine essence. <clears throat> so God is always unbounded, has no time, he does not come to an end, and is debtor to no one. So Novation moves on to consider God's majesty, which man's mind cannot conceive, lacking the eloquence to approach and speak of it. God cannot be declared because to declare him as he is would be to contain him. Think about that. To declare him as he is would be to contain him, but God is what? He is unboundedness. We we say he's majestic when we use terms to speak of the God who is beyond terms. But again, we, we use creation as God accommodates to us. He gives us the language to use back to him. Uh, Novation sees that all human discourse about God is encompassing and containing him. Thus, whatever is thought and spoke about God is less than he. Novation writes, We can in some degree be conscious of him in silence, but we cannot in discourse unfold them as he is. End quote. Novation stresses the unbounded glory of God because God is uncreated being. We cannot even fathom what uncreated omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, eternal, and necessary being is. And when we acknowledge that, before we embark on theological discourse, we situate ourselves in the proper place to engage in discourse. We're the creature, he's the creator. And so innovation is really making a point to stress that. Now some might think, again, we're kind of going too far, we're going too philosophical, um, but I think it's we need to have uh, the right foundation, and it's important that, again, when we really start getting into it, if, we, if God isn't these things, I don't mean things, but these attributes, these negative qualifiers about um, what he is, not what he is, then the, the, the way he speaks about himself in Scripture ultimately lacks the foundation to substantiate it. <clears throat> um, now, again, Scripture reveals to us who God is. This is just conceptual language to be able to discuss things, and discuss about the essence of God. But basically, we begin our talk about God by acknowledging that we cannot truly talk about God. So then, what? when we do talk about God, what are we speaking about? After all, Scripture is God's word to us about himself. So we must be able to use his words to express something about him, right? Novation reminds us that the words given to us allow us to comprehend something about the essence of God as revealed, not as he is. He writes, quote, For you should call him light, you would be speaking of his creature rather than of himself. You would not declare him. Or you should call him strength, you would rather be speaking of and bringing out his power than speaking of himself. Or should you call him majesty, you would rather be describing his honor than himself. So again, these terms are created terms. These words are created words that we use to say something about God. Because we cannot say that the divine essence is light, right? It's, it's imagery. It's something that we can use. And so one of the debacles that was happening uh, a little bit later, we'll see that, is in the Cappadocian Fathers, there was a big, big kind of debate with... Um, 
Oh, I'm forgetting names like I always do. Um, Gregory of Nyssa, and he had a treatise called On Not Three Gods, and his opponent was making the mistake of taking these words and saying, when we, when we say that God is this, we are actually referring to the divine essence. And he was saying, no, you can't do that. And so novation is obviously recognizing that, right? So we cannot say what he is, right? Um, but we can say something um, that points us to his is. Because, of the, again, if there's no word that can fully express God, if we say he is light, then that would declare him, but we can't declare him in his in his essence. I hope that makes sense. We can't contain him in a word. Okay. Oh, did I even? Oh, okay, I thought that I had a, on a slide. I guess not. Okay. But he then asked, and this is an ovation. He then asked, how can how can we say or think about that which is greater than all words and thoughts? How can we grasp God? Interestingly, one grasps God when one grasps that one cannot grasp him. I'll say that again. This is not innovation. This is I was writing this and I thought kind of interesting. One grasps God when one grasps that one cannot grasp him. I think that kind of qualifies it pretty well. Back to novation. He concludes quote, for he is above all that can be said, for he is a certain mind generating and filling all things which without any beginning or end of time controls by the highest and most perfect reason the naturally linked causes of things so as to result in benefit to all end quote so in chapter three novation picks back up about how a creature can learn and know of god if god is as novation writes above all that can be said then what can we say about him so we see he's he's spending a lot of time on this because again it's very important because we don't want just to be babbling and you know using these very lofty philosophical terms and supposed to be talking about God but we're really not we're saying what he's not and so I think Novation wants to really get to the point to where how can we as creatures learn about our uh, Creator in a way that's befitting of Him because we cannot exhaust Him but we want to be able to grasp our Creator. And he's revealed himself to us in Christ. But again, remember, they're dealing with discussions about the Trinity. And this, this doctrine is being developed here. He's working through this because um, there are heretics to come that are going to challenge. And they, they are challenging. That's why you see a lot of these type of dogmatic, polemic treatises in the early church fathers. Because they're constantly being challenged. Uh, it, not so much as straight you know, those outside the camp, but those within the church trying to, you know, work through these doctrines, say, what are we actually saying? What is God about? And um, there's things that came across their table and they had to address. So, again, he says, what then can we, can we say about him? And he answers, and since by the gaze of our eyes we cannot see him, we rightly learn of him from the greatness and the power and the majesty of his works. For the invisible things of him, says the Apostle Paul, Paul, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by those things which are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. End quote. Well, that's end of the passage from Romans. But, uh, Nebation continues. So that the human mind, learning hidden things from those that are manifest, from the greatness of the works which it should behold, might with the eyes of the mind consider the greatness of the architect. So again, you know, that goes back to the classic Ray Comfort, um, you know, uh, evangelistic tactic. You know, when you look at a painting, how do you know it has a painter? It's the painting itself, right? So we look at creation, the immensity and the grandeur of his creation, and it tells us, it's intended to tell us that we have an immense creator, the greatness of the architect, as he says. So again, he cites Paul's words from Romans 1, 19 through 20. And God has revealed himself through creation. So by what we see with our eyes, his glorious works, we can understand, know who God is, his eternal power and divine nature. Right? So creation becomes the medium for us to see that God is eternal and divine. 
But does that mean mankind can know God through purely natural theology or general revelation? That's kind of in a lot of discussions right now. Natural theology is a big deal. Um, Dovation does not clarify. Now, all of mankind has rejected the truth about God, which Paul says was plainly revealed to it. Again, back to Romans 119. God's evidence of his existence, his eternal nature and divine power is clearly known, but man has rejected it. Natural man looks at the creation, looks at the stars, looks at the moon, looks at the sun, and thinks that those things are divine. And that was a mistake. It's a mistake of identity, right? They are not looking beyond that. They are looking at the, at the creature, the physical, and not looking at the spiritual that's behind it, the supernatural, if you will. So in that sense... Mankind naturally knows enough about God to the point that its rejection of him is a willful or a willing rejection of the truth about him. Therefore, all of mankind is under condemnation. But with that said, we have yet to see if novation delineates the general knowledge of God and the special knowledge of God through Christ. In chapter 4, Novation discusses God apophatically, which is be negative terms, negative theology. There's apoph- apophatically and cataphatically, but I don't like saying those words because I always mumble them and jack them up. So, um, apophatic. He explains what God is not, right? It's thus leading us to speak of God's perfection. So we move from the, the, negative, the negative attributes to God's perfections. God is immutable which means he is always good and the same. He is infinite, having no beginning or end. He is incorruptible and immortal. So these negative descriptions of God, seeing what God is not, tells us much about him. Uh, Novation regarding God's immutability writes, slide 7, Thus there is never in him any accession or increase of any part or honor, lest anything should appear to have ever been wanting to his perfection. Nor is any loss sustained in him, lest a degree of mortality should appear to have been suffered by him. But what he is, he always is. And who he is, he is always himself. And what character he has, he always has. End quote. So, so while he's speaking, so I'm sorry, while he's specifically talking about God's immutability, he roots his perfection in God's self. And in doing so, we get a hint of the doctrine of divine simplicity, and more to come in the next chapter. So, looking at this really quick, so when he says that, there is no accession or increase on any part. So, God cannot be greater or lesser than what he is, right? If that was the case, then if he could be greater, then he's not perfect. Obviously, if he's less, then he's not perfect, right? Um, So, he makes it that clear point. He is, he always is, and who he is, he is always himself. And what he has, he has always had from himself. That's where we start to again look at the doctrine of divine simplicity. Slide eight. Whoops. Go back. He says, Novation writes, For whatever in whatever it be in him which constitutes divinity must necessarily exist always, maintaining itself by its own power, so that he should always be God. And thus he says from Exodus three fourteen, I am that I am. So God can only be God. By what God is in himself. <clears throat> There's a common phrase. All that is in God is God. Nothing can be God except God completely. He cannot have an attribute or quality. Otherwise it, there would be something, parts, that he acquired from another source. Novation continues this theme of negative descriptions of God. Demonstrating their necessary existence in God. If he is to be perfect and beyond, to be beyond all comprehension. In chapter 5, Novation makes the argument that we cannot ascribe any human vices to God through though scripture uses them. As anger, indignation, and hatred, even though scripture uses those of him, we cannot say that those of God in his divine essence. And this is what we call, again, anthropomorphic language or human-like language. The reason being is that we can only understand anger and wrath from a creaturely perspective, which can corrupt man. But God cannot be corrupted. Novation refers to them as passions, which are rightly said to be in man, in man, right, men or man, but not rightly in God. 
He says, and how is man corruptible by these, but God is not? Very good question. Novation writes, these things forsooth, I don't know what that means, I forget. These things forsooth, <laughs> that's the translation, sorry, have their force, which they may exercise, but only where a material capable of impression precedes them, not where a substance that cannot be impressed precedes them, for that God is angry and rises from no vice in him. End quote. So, what's he saying? So, I think Novation is saying that man is corrupted by such vices because man can be impressed or acted on because he is a material being. Thus, passions are proper to what can be impressed or acted upon. For example, man can be moved in his emotions, right? He has situations, conflicts that move him to be anger, to be outraged, to be sad. Thus, we can be acted upon, but God is what? Impassable. He cannot be acted upon to move him in a way that he would act contrary to God's self. That's a big deal. The impassibility discussion is a big deal. Um, people think, well, doesn't God, are we, doesn't God, uh, isn't he moved by our, our, our feelings and doesn't we, don't we affect him that way? And now God doesn't, you know, he doesn't move in, in with every whim of every prayer, um, especially those prayers that are rooted in self and selfishness, right? So, but, but God acts apart from his creation. So that way God can truly be who God is. If he acts in a manner where he's a debtor to somebody or he feels compelled, then God would be acting in a manner that's not proper to who he is. Uh, but back to this. So God cannot be impressed by passions because they do not properly belong to his divine substance. For God cannot be acted upon by anything other than God's perfect holy self, which is impassable. So when God is said to be angry or have hatred, such notions in God do not arise out of vice as they do in man, Rather, as Novation writes, he is angry for our advantage, for he is merciful even then when he threatens, because by these threats men are recalled to rectitude, for fear is necessary for those who want the motive to a virtuous life, that they who have forsaken reason may at least be moved by terror. Terror. And thus all those, either angers of God or hatreds of God, or whatever they are of this kind, being displayed for our medicine, as the case teaches, have arisen of wisdom, not from vice, nor do they originate from frailty, wherefore also they cannot avail for the corruption of God. So scripture uses words that help us understand in some sense, what God thinks about sin and wickedness. However, God's display of anger and hatred at humanity, resulting in various acts of judgment and curses, as Novation stated, flow from wisdom and holiness. Again, God cannot be impressed as creatures can, which is proper to us, fallen sinners. God responds through perfections, which are always derived from himself. So, since God is holy, he only acts in holiness and nothing can impress upon him that will corrupt him in a manner to act not in accordance with his perfect holiness. So this section here definitely may be a little challenging, um, but again, he's trying to you know, maintain the proper, the proper understanding of God as far as who he is in himself and realize that the things that mankind has cannot be attributed to directly to God in his essence. So he's saying that, that God uses these things for a wisdom for us, right? It's a way that God is, is speaking to us as accommodation. And so the anger, the, the threats, that kind of thing, that's used in scripture to impress upon men to do what? To repent, to act righteous, to return to God, to pursue holiness and that kind of thing. So it's, it's through wisdom, right? Not from any vice in God that he uses for us, his creatures. So in closing of chapter 5, Novation concludes with a further explication on divine simplicity, which functions as the foundation of God's perfection and to also demonstrate why man is imperfect and incorrupt, I'm sorry, and corruptible. Imperfect and corruptible, excuse me. 
Basically put, man can be corrupted because he has body parts. He is a material being. God is not constructed or associated with bodily parts. Now, this doesn't imply that body parts are evil or wicked in themselves, as God's creation for was good that God made them. But what Innovation writes, he says, God is simple and without any corporeal commixture, being wholly of that essence, which, whatever it be, he alone knows, constitutes his being, since he is called spirit. And thus, those things which in men are faulty and corrupting, since they arise from the corruptibility of the body and matter itself in God cannot exert the force of corruptibility since as we have said they have come not of vice but of reason now, God refers to God's in, as being an, an intelligible essence right intelligibility uh, not intelligibility but spirit um, by reason there's no materiality to, to God now much of contemporary theology holds to some form of divine simplicity by merely affirming that God does not have body parts. But simplicity is more than affirming God doesn't have body farts. <laughs> body farts, excuse me. Body parts. It's affirming his divinity. His simplicity is the constitution of his divinity, just as compositeness is the constitution of humans. Right? We are composite beings, multiple things brought together. Simplicity is is a unity but not anything being brought together but it's the simplest form so there's no parts to it it's oneness it's wholeness it's complete it's it's all in one so we see the logic and innovations thought in his understanding that god's being is spirit does a spirit have parts uh no as a spiritual being or referred to as an intellectual being or a being of reason he must be simple, not composite, if he's to be omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, and all the other appellations of deity ascribed to him. So again, let's, just, let's, let's look at omnipresent. If God had a body or parts, how could he be everywhere at once completely in himself? That was Augustine's big, big dilemma. He kept thinking of God as his body, this really huge, large body. But then again... If God is everywhere present, Father, the Son, Spirit, no matter where you're at, He's completely there, completely there, then He cannot have a body, and He cannot be omnipresent. And so I hope you see that when we, when God talks about His presence to creation and where He is and what He can see, what He can know, if He is not omnipresent, uh, He cannot do those things as He says He does in Scripture. Same thing with His knowledge. He knows every thought every creature has or will have, right? His power, there's nothing that can thwart his power. And so if he has a body, if he has a body, then his body, in a sense, could have a weakness. It could not be all powerful because a body would mean something he was given. And there is a power that he was given. It may be the almightiest power, possibly, possibly. But the thing is then that there's there's a possibility that there's something greater than his than his body. That has power. So that's why these things are important to talk about. <clears throat> just think. I've already discussed, I always do this, but I'll just run through it here. So can God be everywhere present all at once if he has a body? No. Thus he must be simple. Again, the simplicity of God allows him to be everywhere at once because he is simple. There's no parts to him. So he is 4.3 billion light years away and he's also in Mexico. Completely. Completely. A simple being can do that. One with parts cannot, because all the parts have, have to be there. And again, this doctrine becomes developed further in the years to come. But toward the end of his treatise, Novation considers some objections to the hypostatic union, specifically the argument that if Scripture tells us that Christ died, then it must be accepted, excuse me, that Scripture is likewise telling us that God died. Novation responds by expressing that the scripture is clear on the matter, but the objectors are not understanding what they're reading. Pretty simple. And so Novation, showing the folly of their ways, shows the absurdity of accepting what scripture does not tell us, namely that Christ is not only God, rather he is man and God. Now, I wrote that, and for some reason it's not very clear to me. 
Um, so the folly of their way shows the absurdity of accepting what Scripture does not tell. So they're accepting what Scripture does not tell us, namely that Christ is not only God, rather he is a man of God. I don't know why I said that. Um, hmm. I'll keep going. So Novation writes, If Scripture were to set forth that Christ is God only, with no association of human weakness mingled with his nature, then their arguments might work. If Christ is purely deity, or deity only, and the scripture tells us Christ died, then we conclude, conclude that God died. But that is impossible, writes Novation, because scripture tells us that our Lord is man and God. So you can see the consistency is in argumentation without even really making an argument. Right? Rather, he's just taking all of scripture in consideration, the rule of faith, as we mentioned earlier, ensuring a balanced approach as it pertains to passages that speak to the humanity and the deity of Christ. So, Novation follows up with explaining what is proper to both natures. Beginning with the deity, he writes, Who cannot understand that the divinity is impassable, although the human weakness is liable to suffering? End quote. So he makes the key distinction between the divine and the human nature, impassibility. God cannot suffer, man can suffer. And again, he repeats the point that should be so easily understood that the word took on flesh, manifesting himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And that when he died, it was not that God died, but that which died in him was man. However, it's completely theologically accurate to say God died on the cross. And it's also theologically accurate to say that Jesus is the creator of all things. And that's where the communications of properties that come into play. Back to this. And to support his argument, Novation goes to Jesus' words in Matthew 10, 28, where he talks about having no fear in man who can only kill the body, whereas God destroys both body and soul. So he says in the same manner, Jesus' flesh was killed on the cross, but not his soul. Now, what I appreciate about Novation is that he referred directly to Scripture instead of making a metaphysical speculation. Now, grant, now granted, the metaphysicality is still there, but they're rooting everything in what the text says, because the church fathers, they're confined, they're confined by the pages of Scripture. They're confined by the words of Scripture. And that's where um, we find this clean line of development in our theology that holds God's word as being scripture, authoritative. Uh, it's not man's word. And so the heretics, those that went off the rails, they were fine going around that, but not not uh, the, 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 line, the line of orthodoxy that we see streaming through the early church fathers. And again, not every church father was clear on certain points or was even maybe orthodox, but we want to extend grace because you know, the context they're in is definitely not something that, that we are in now. We, we enjoy now the fruits of all those labors and trials and heresies and unfortunately some really horrible things. Um, but that's that's what uh, the Lord's providence brought about to bring us the clear sound doctrine that we have at this point. Um, <clears throat> where was I at? Okay. And we're going to jump <laughs> to chapter 29. I don't know why I did that, but... So with 2 through 9, they're jumping to 29. Uh, I'm sorry, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what he says about the Spirit. So, so in chapter 29, Novation offers a systematic exposition of the person and work of the Spirit, in which we see his hiddenness, yet he is observed everywhere present and active, in that he is weaved in all throughout Scripture, manifesting himself in the divine economy. What's the divine economy again? Well, in this context, he's talking about the manifestation of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in redemptive history. So the the ad intra Trinitarian unity of Father, Son, and Spirit manifesting themselves ad extra in creation. The Spirit, Novation writes, is not new in the Gospel, nor yet even newly given. He is therefore one and the same Spirit who was in the prophets and apostles, except that in the former he was occasional, the former being the Old Testament, right? And in the latter, he's always present. But in the former, 
not as not as sorry in the former not as being always in them in the latter as abiding always in them and in the former distributed with reserve in the latter all poured out think of like the pentecost right in the former given sparingly in the latter liberally bestowed not yet manifested before the lord's resurrection but conferred after the resurrection don't you love how these guys write it's awesome here is the spirit of truth sent to declare all things to the disciples strengthening their hearts and minds who has given gifts to the children of god novation writes the spirit placed prophets in the church instructs teachers directs tongues gives powers and healing does wonderful works offers discrimination of spirits affords power to the government suggests counsels and orders and arranges whatever other gifts there are of charismata and thus make the lord's church everywhere and in all perfected and completed so since it is the eternal spirit who dwells in christ the spirit's outpouring onto the church we can say the fullness of christ has been displayed and manifested in the church the spirit is working in us for eternity training our bodies to advance in immortality by restraining quote insatiable desires controls immoderate loss lusts quenches unlawful fires covers sorry conquers reckless impulses repels drunkenness checks avarice drives away luxurious revelings links love binds together affections keeps down sex s-e-c-t-s orders the rule of truth overcomes heretics turns out the wicked guards the gospel end quote again i love how this type of writing you see in the early church fathers they were just so um, immersed in the text and really wanted to exegete and dissect um, really the kind of the human soul and then the power of god in bringing creation to the totality of his purposes uh, that we will obviously wait in for a final consummation so including our survey of novation's doctrine of the trinity we will look at his final argument which considers the ad intro relations specifically jesus is begotten this from the father as it pertains to origination in time so he begins with a doxological statement of god the father as the founder of all of creation having no beginning because he's invisible infinite immortal and eternal the one god but when speaking of the son Novation must explicate on how we understand Christ as begotten of the Father, yet having no beginning as he is God of God, the exact image of the Father. While the Son is born of the Father, he is always in the Father, unless there was a time when the Father was not the Father, having preceded the Son. But that is obviously not the case. Novation, however... He considers in some sense that there is a beginning in the Son, not a temporal one, whereby the Father willed that the Son be, and the Son proceeded from the Father. He says his beginning is something that has always been in the Father, but as the creator of all things, and that the Son, quote, is before all things, but after the Father, since all things were made by him, and he proceeded from him of whose will all things were made end quote now the language seems odd because as he continues forward on his tangent of the son's begottenness from the father being before all things yet he doesn't have a beginning apart from the father he is fully god and the father having the full blessedness of him so novation considers the objection that if the son is born from the father this would cause a second person that takes from the father the characteristics that he is one God. So to show the Son's begottenness does not entail separation of being in God, as in two beginnings, two fathers, two invisibilities, and thus two gods. So Novation writes, Whatever he is, he is not of himself, because he is not unborn. Again, he's speaking of the Son. But he is of the Father, because he is begotten whether as being the word whether as being the power or as being the wisdom or as being the light or as being the sun and whatever of these he is and that he is not from any other source as we've already said before than from the father 
owing his origin to his father. He could not make a disagreement in the divinity by the number of two gods, since he gathered his beginning by being born of him who is one God. So it sounds like he's, you know, he's speaking of a again a time. Though I don't want to say time, but really, um, just the idea that he's he's before all creation, obviously, but he's trying to speak in a way that the 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 son does not take from the father the oneness of God. So he's trying to speak in a manner that how he is from the father, but he doesn't take that oneness, and so he kind of in a sense goes through here about. Um, being of the Father, but uh, ultimately he's the power or the being of the wisdom. And we hear this in the early church fathers, where they refer to Christ back to First Corinthians, First Corinthians, one twenty one, right? Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God. Maybe it's one twenty four. And so he's kind of using that language, the power or the wisdom, or he's the light, right? All these kinds of things. So he's he's fully from God, but he doesn't take the Father's qualities in himself. He is these things specific. So. Again, they're still trying to, early church is obviously still trying to work through this. Um, but the scriptures clearly show the full divinity of the Son with the Father. In abiding by what scripture says about the Father and the Son and the Spirit, they are both God of all, and they are both the one and only true God. The demonstration of deity and unity in the Godhead, Novation writes, comes through the manner in which the Father and the Son manifest what belongs to divinity, majesty and lordship as examples. Though not expressly referencing it, what follows is Novation's exposition of 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 28. The divinity, of, the divinity of God is declared by the Son, who Novation says is also an angel, not in a creaturely constitution, but as the messenger who has come to announce the great counsel of God, thus declaring the Father's divinity. And in the revelation of his Son... The Father subjects all things to the Son, in which the Father gives and directs majesty and lordship to his Son. And then this is reciprocated, whereby the Son demonstrates his unity of divinity with the Father, in that the Son refers all that he's received to the Father, remitting again to the Father the whole authority of his divinity. And he's talking about handing the kingdom back over, and then Christ will be subject to the one who subjected him, and then that way, um, God will be all in all, and the Father will be glorified. Yeah, the whole whole section there. I can't remember it off the top of my head. Um, so that's that. That's what he uh, Novation is talking talking about here. So Novation refers to this reciprocation of divinity as the Son's communion of substance to the Father. However, we don't see him uh, metaphysically tease out the communion of substance as his use of substance seems to be a metaphysical statement. Again, that's going to be, I think, something developed further. So, the demonstration of returning and reflecting majesty and divinity appeals to the unity of the Father and the Son, so that reasonably God the Father is God of all, and the source also of his Son himself, whom he begot as Lord. Moreover, the Son is God of all else, because God the Father put before all him whom he begot. Kind of strange language, but again, they're trying to realize that the divine simplicity of God, it means he has no parts, but he's Father, he's Son, he's Spirit. But he's speaking of the relationality between the persons of the Godhead and how they all point to each other uh, as persons within the divine Godhead. So, conclusion. We see that Novation's theology is orthodox. So why is he an obscure figure? And I kind of talked about this in the beginning. Well, he's noteful, he's noteworthy for two reasons. One, for his work on the Trinity, which we touched some of, touched a little bit of it, which was profound. The other, dubious, is that he led a schism in the Western Church, which arose out of the Decian persecution around 250, where those who fled, they believed, Novation believed, and he had a group, that they should not be allowed back into the Western Church. And ultimately, the Pope that was ultimately elected, he kind of became this anti-Pope and led a party um, because he did not want Cornelius as the Pope. And it was kind of an opposition to him. And eventually, unfortunately, he and his group were excommunicated, but uh, the Council of Nicaea elaborated the terms that would allow them back into Catholic communion. So 
Again, he has good theology, but he does some type of this move that really irritates a lot of people and gets excommunicated. And, you know, um, unfortunately, it uh, didn't look good for him. And so really, I think his, you know, his work on the Trinity is really, really good. And I think it deserves more of a readership. Um, but obviously, there's some political things going on and schisms and whatever have you. And it, unfortunately, what it does when that, when that, stuff, that kind of stuff happens those that theologian his works don't ultimately kind of get used later on as much as they should and um unfortunately yeah, that's why he remains this kind of dubious not, not dubious obscure sorry obscure uh character in the early church but again i think it's very helpful so that is the end of our lecture number seven i hope that it was uh, interesting learning about novation and just kind of seeing then he can he follows that same stream of of classical theism that we see in their church and again he was another key role in the development of the doctrine of the trinity so till next time uh god bless and take care